Welcome to the Ask Your Mentor podcast from Dementia Researcher and Alzheimer's Research UK, where mentees interview their mentors to hear about their careers, experiences, and to find out what makes them tick. Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to the Ask Your Mentor podcast. Uh, my name is Dr. Chris Henstridge. I'm a principal investigator at the University of Dundee, and my research really is focused on synaptic change in brain diseases such as motor neuron disease and Alzheimer's. Um, I'm at the stage of my career now where I've just recently uh, set up and run my own lab, but that definitely doesn't need, mean that I don't need mentorship. Um, in fact, mentorship is something that is certainly beneficial at all stages of your career. And I'm very pleased today, today um, to be chatting with my fantastic mentor, uh, Professor Patrick Lewis. He's a professor of neuroscience at the Royal Veterinary College in London. Hello, Patrick. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. Um, thanks for taking your time to join us. Um, Patrick and I were matched through the Alzheimer's Re uh, Research UK Mentorship Scheme, uh, which is a fantastic new scheme uh, that helps to pair uh, early career re researchers with more senior academics to help grow their skills and gain new perspectives on their career. Um, as you may know, these shows are all about recognizing that there is no such thing as a standard career path. And I think there are two good examples here, um, and we'll hear much more about Patrick's. So we start each one by asking our mentors to take us through their CV in a similar way to they might do in a job interview. So let's get into it, Patrick. So um, where do we start? Um, I started out in science at the University of Manchester. So I, I started uh, doing a biochemistry degree. Um, and I guess one of the interesting things sort of looking, uh, looking at it from a career and development uh, perspective is that I really had no, no real aim to become a scientist. Um, originally, actually, I'd wanted to join the army and I'd actually even signed on the dotted line and was uh, sponsored by the, uh, the army during uh, my undergraduate degree. But as part of my undergraduate degree, uh, I did a sandwich year. Uh, and I spent that sandwich year over at the Mayo Clinic in uh, in Jacksonville, uh, at the Alzheimer's Center there, uh, working with uh, Todd Golde, who's, uh, who's actually now at uh, Emory University and is a cell biologist working on uh, presenilins and A-beta, um, and spent a year working in the lab there. And that really changed my perspective on what it was I wanted to do with my career. Um, so when I came back, I uh, very politely asked the Army if I could uh, remove my signature from the dotted line. Uh, they said, yes, that's fine, but you're going to have to pay us back all the sponsorship money that uh, that we gave you. Um, and in my final year, I started looking around for a PhD. Um, and uh, so this was back in the late 90s, early, uh, early 2000s. And it was just really on the uh, the leading edge of the wave of uncertainty around uh, mad cow disease, uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, and uh, Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. Um, and it so happened that the MRC prion unit down in London, it was then at uh, St. Mary's Hospital, it's now at, uh, at UCL, uh, were advertising for a technician post, uh, which I applied for, and they said, uh, thanks very much for applying. Um, we don't want to offer you the job, but have you thought about doing a PhD? Um, and that's basically how I ended up in a scientific career, I think. That's uh, certainly the starting point for me, really. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting early history. And um, I'm, I, I quite like the idea of taking you back to the beginning of that, actually. So the, the idea of joining the army. So was there a kind of a family link there or, or a kind of previous history of family being in the army? Or was it just purely you decided at the time you went to... Yeah, I mean, I think it uh, it dates back to uh, sitting in the uh, careers library at uh, my school, not really knowing what it was I wanted to do with myself, and finding a pamphlet about the army uh, that said they would sponsor you through uh, through university. It sounded like an interesting career, and I'm sure it would have been an interesting career, uh, but it would have been a very different one to the one which uh, which I'm pursuing. So it was a, the, there was no real sort of family. In fact, I suspect that my parents were somewhat uh, somewhat aghast at the fact that I was uh, joining the British Army. Never actually asked them that question, so that's something perhaps I should ask them at some point. Hmm. Okay, and we we talk a lot these days as well about kind of first generation researchers and scientists. So, would you classify yourself as one of those? Were you the first kind of in the family to go into research? 
No, not at all. So my uh, my dad is a uh, or was he passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Um, he uh, he was a chemist. He was a research chemist at the uh, originally at the University of Manchester and then for many many years at the Open University. Uh, so I grew up um, with sort of slightly uh, slightly crazy chemistry experiments being done in my uh, in my dad's garage and uh, being shown how to make things go bang and change color so actually I, i'm very, very much not a, a first generation uh, scientist okay okay interesting um okay so when you talk about your career you, you got to that kind of phd stage essentially and you started your phd um how did you find that transition and, and moving sort of into that sort of phd uh, environment I, you know, it, it was very interesting. I think I probably found it a different experience for many people because of that year at the Mayo Clinic, uh, which was a, a really, really intense year. It was in a, a fantastic research environment with a lot of funding and a lot of very, very interesting projects going on. There were a lot, a lot of new discoveries coming through in the uh, in the dementia field uh, at the time. So there were lots of new genes to look at, lots of new mutations to study. So uh, that actually, if I look back, is probably the single most productive year of my life in terms of research and publications and so on and so forth. So shifting from from there, where I'd been involved in lots of different projects and uh, and doing lots of different things, onto a PhD project where basically I was doing one question or ended up being two questions over the course of three years. Actually, was that there was a big change in a uh, shifting gear there. Uh, so actually, that really for me was the thing that uh, I found most surprising. It was very different. Um, uh, different way to think about the science. Uh, very, very uh, constructive, very, uh, you know, re really, really helped me think about how you set up research questions and how you look at them over uh, over a longer period. Uh, and it just so happens that the uh, pre on research tends to be uh, longer in scale than many other uh, fields as well anyway. Uh, so that sort of lends that sort of longer, uh, longer term view. Um, so I think that was actually probably the, the, the major shift. I mean, the, the other major shift was working in a containment laboratory. Um, so previously, I'd been working, I, I think I'd done a little bit of radiation work, which uh, requires obviously quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of safety, uh, consciousness and, uh, and uh, making sure your protocols are, are pretty much up to scratch. Uh, but shifting into a containment laboratory where you have to go into the lab through an airlock was uh, quite a big culture shift as well. Mm, sure. Um, I'm, all, I'm also quite interested in, in establishing um, Kind of work-life balances mm. and working in what was or was still as a prestigious mrc institute as a phd student were there quite high expectations on you in terms of um workload and hours expected and days of the week you'd be in and out of the labs and things like that and, and did you set boundaries or did you kind of go along for the ride um yeah i know i, I think there was a uh... The, a lot of the experiments were ones which don't necessarily uh, pay attention to uh, what day of the week it is and, and what time it is. And I remember having one particularly uh, lovely experiment where we were measuring the kinetics of amyloid formation by uh, the prion protein, uh, which required five hour time points over the course of a week, uh, which meant I had to book into uh, one of the, I think it was the, uh, the doctor's accommodation across the road from the Institute of Neurology so that I could go in, take a sample, measure it, go back sleep for a couple of hours and then uh, seesaw backwards uh, backwards and forwards over the course of seven days. So there, there were very much uh, experiments like that. But the work-life balance wasn't too bad during my PhD, I would say. I, I would say I probably worked more hours and uh, with less concern as to what day of the week it was when I was in Florida. Um, and again, I think that, that there's a part of the uh, the sort of the the, the institutional framework that the uh, the MRC units provide with that longer term funding uh, sometimes makes it a little bit easier to to strike that balance. There are other challenges in terms of uh, expectations and what you're going to do with the, that research, um, but but I think actually it was probably a relatively balanced time in uh, my life. I got to uh, sort of do a, a bit of travelling. I got to do uh, a little bit of uh, sport for the university and stuff. So th there were other things that uh, kept me occupied as well. So it sounds like you had quite a good balance mm. uh, from from work and life. Um, so I imagine there's probably quite a lot of PhD students that are listening to the podcast, and I realise your PhD might have been a few years ago now. But is there any <laughs> is there a piece of advice that you could give to PhD students now who are going through their PhD 
that you might have wanted to have known during your time as a PhD student? So, so I look back and I, I actually, I, I think I didn't use my, the time during my PhD as well as I could have done. Um, I think I, I was very focused on the project, which is good. And, you know, the, at the end of uh, a PhD, you need to write a small, uh, small book and, uh, and be examined on it and so on and so forth. So it's important to have that focus. But it's also a, a period in time where you have a little bit of a license to read around and to look at other areas and to think about the science in a way that when you become a postdoc, if you become a postdoc and if you then go on to uh, lead projects, actually the, the thing that I find now that I don't have time for is that sort of wider reading as much as I would like to. Um, so I think actually I would, my bit of advice would be treasure the time that you have and use it as wisely as you can. <laughs> Great, thank you, Patrick. Um, so, so after your PhD, you then made the jump sort of back over the pond uh, mm -hmm. to the states for your first postdoc position. So, so what kind of prompted the move specifically to that lab for a postdoc? What decisions were made to to sort of foster that move? So I, don't, I don't know if there was an active uh, decision making process. Um, I think I, I'd, I'd made the decision that I wanted to go back to the States for a period of time. And actually, when I, um, when I was looking around for PhDs, one of the things that I considered was uh, doing a PhD over in the States and then took one look at uh, graduate school in the States and how long it could take uh, and decided that it was perhaps better to uh, do a PhD in the UK. So it was always something that I'd been thinking about. Um, and really, I was, I was looking around for slightly different areas. So I've been working on uh, BSE, uh, Kreuzer-Jakob disease, and Scrapie, all of it in a, a containment lab environment. Um, and I was interested in, in broadening out a little bit, moving into a, a, a another field. And actually looked at a, a variety of different, uh, different possibilities. Uh, one thing I was kind of interested in, which never really came to anything, was looking at yeast prions, uh, working on uh, trying to understand prion-like, uh, prion or prion-like biology in yeast and how they control tran, uh, transcription and uh, shifting from one state to another. Uh, so actually, I, I looked into that uh, and uh, applied for a couple of positions, didn't come to anything, didn't uh, didn't get uh, any job offers. Um, and then I was attending a Cold Swing Harbor meeting on neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and some of the folks that I worked with during my time at the Mayo Clinic, Mark Cookson and John Hardy, were there and were presenting. they just um, been part of the team that were looking at a new Parkinson's gene, uh, LERC2. Um, and they were, there was this real sort of sense of uh, excitement and enthusiasm about really understanding what LERC2 was doing. And they were looking for sort of quasi biochemists, maybe a bit of cell biology type people uh, to come along and try and characterize LERC2. Um, and they had a position open at the NIH um, and said, well, if you're interested, that uh, we'd be happy to have you come over and uh, talk about it a bit more. Um, and uh, basically, one thing followed another there and uh, I ended up moving over to the NIH. And I think it was really it was the, uh, the the sense of excitement and the sense of potential looking at uh, this new locus for Parkinson's disease, which really uh, pulled me in and really attracted me to working there. And uh, added to that, of course, working at the NIH, is a, it's a, a really interesting place to work, very different to the uh, places I'd worked uh, before then. So it was a great opportunity just in terms of experience, um, aside from anything else. Did some of your key publications then come from that postdoc period? Yeah, absolutely. I know basically I'm still working on Lot 2 and we're now nearly 20 years down the road. So I moved there in 2005, I think. Uh, the Lot 2 was identified as a PD gene in 2004. So it was really, there was the, uh, the cell biology and biochemistry was ramping up then. Um, and it really, it was a very, very exciting period. Actually, Lot 2 from for me is still an exciting gene to work on, but especially during those uh, first four or five years, there was so much that we didn't know um, that there were lots of exciting uh, questions that needed uh, answering. And so um, there are a couple of publications looking at uh, the entomology of LERC2, looking at the how it functions as a GTPAs and what mutations do to it. Those really have laid the foundations for 
the bulk of the work, not all the work, but probably I would say about 70, 70 odd percent of the research since, uh, since then has been following on from those early publications and really trying to understand it. And it gives you an insight as to how complex uh, too is uh, that 20 years down the road, actually there are still bits of it that we don't really understand. So that, so it sounds like that postdoc position really kind of cemented your academic career going mm. forward. You see most of your research has kind of followed on from that since. Um, so in some ways it kind of really showcases the importance of that first postdoc step in a kind of academic um, trajectory. And um, if I understand correctly, did you do a second postdoc then after that, or was it purely one postdoc and then into the kind of academic career track? So yeah, it's sort of of, um, it's a sort of a wiggly line. And I, th I think uh, depending upon uh, who you talk to and whose uh, career you're looking back on, um, I think uh, quite often there, there are sort of wiggly bits where uh, you're sort of in this half light between an academic career and a uh, postdoctoral career. Sometimes sometimes there is that sort of clear uh, break point, uh, but quite often there's a sort of gray area in between the uh, where, when you're a postdoc and when you're actually uh, leading a group. And that's certainly true for me. So um, I was at NIH for two years um, and then moved back to London. Uh, so I've been, been at the Institute of Neurology uh, with the MRC Prion unit. They've actually moved out from there now. Um, but uh, John Hardy was moving back to the UK after over a decade, oh yeah, well over a decade in the US uh, to set up a, a new group in uh, at UCL. And so I moved back with him and took up a, a three-year brain research trust as was uh, basically one of the, the brain chair, I think it's Brain UK now, um, uh, funded a three-year postdoctoral fellowship uh, working in uh, John's group. Uh, and there really I was provided with the space and opportunity to develop my own ideas and to start that transition. So really there was a sort of, I would say, a, probably a three-year transition from that postdoc to uh, the point where I was actually beginning to lead my, my own group and beginning to develop my own ideas to the point where really I was the one uh, directing where things were going. I guess that's, that's the the beauty and the kind of opportunities that a fellowship provides is that chance to do something a little bit different from your current PI and, and sort of gain that opportunity to, to, to lead and budget your own project. Um, was there a point that you you suddenly kind of realized or felt that actually I can I can do this on my own and you then felt ready to kind of make the step into sort of real, well, let's say real, real independence um, and set up your own group? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that I would pinpoint a, a sort of precise moment in time, um, but I think it was during that three years. And actually, interesting enough, and of course, there are many, many good things about fellowships. One of the bad things is that the moment that you're awarded one, there's a fuse that is ticking um, because eventually that fellowship is going to run out and you need to find something to replace it with and uh, something new to do. Um, and I think it was during, as those uh, three years were passing, probably about the sort of midpoint where I started looking ahead and thinking, wow, actually I, I need to find some way to support myself if I'm going to continue in research, um, that really sort of uh, pinpointed, right, actually that's, I, I really need to start uh, not generating my own ideas, but really sort of building on those and building them into a, a research program. Um, and that led on to me applying for a Parkinson's UK fellowship, a, a career development fellowship with Parkinson's UK. Um, and that I think is when I really started uh, moving towards a point where, where I was uh, really uh, running a project and running a, a program myself. So once you've got those programs established, and you feel that, okay, now, now's the time to become a PI. Um, how do you decide the next step? So how do you decide where you're going to apply to and, and what you're kind of looking for to get that first lab established? And I think uh, at the time it was uh, whatever opportunities were, were out there. Um, so I think that the Parkinson's uh, research community is, is relatively fortunate to have uh, a number of different funding bodies which are focused on Parkinson's research, some in the UK, but also internationally. Uh, and so uh, one of the ways in which I sort of built up the momentum to apply for a, for a full fellowship was by getting smaller grants, uh, one from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, uh, one, from, uh, for one from UCL that allowed me to start putting together those ideas into a coherent grant application, uh, some of them getting funded, some of them not, getting that feedback and uh, really uh, 
not perfecting, but but developing my way of uh, pitching my research uh, and pitching my ideas uh, to see if I could get uh, get funding for them. Um, and so I think that's that's really where it sort of started uh, building up into that uh, into that 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 the the point at which I was able to make that jump into a uh, into a fellowship application. Um, and I think I, I, I think at the time I was thinking a little bit about applying for MRC fellowships. Uh, Alain Plum Favreau, who uh, started uh, in the same department, had just got a, a career development fellowship with the MRC. So I was looking across at that, thinking, you know, should I put together something uh, along those lines? Uh, but because my research was uh, very much focused on Parkinson's, actually Parkinson's UK were the uh, were the obvious first starting point. Although it should uh, should be noted that Parkinson's UK no longer have a career development fellowship. So uh, so actually, that's one route that would no longer be there for me uh, were I to go back in time. So after that, once you finished these positions, you then successfully moved to Reading. Mm. Um, and so again, I guess, I guess the question is, why Reading? <laughs> um, what was the, the selling point that kind of that brought you there? So it's a, like uh, like many of these uh, these career decisions. Actually, there's a, there's a load of reasons underlying it. Um, one was the uh, the nature of living on fellowship funding. Um, so I was two years through the first, so the, the way Parkinson's UK, UK fellowships used to work was you would have three years of funding and then potentially a further two years. Um, and so a five-year fellowship in total. And actually that, that allows you to do quite a lot. That allows you to have that stability for a period of time. But uh, it was very, very clear, and this is uh, entirely understandable, I think, from uh, from university finance p uh, point of view, uh, that at the end of that five years, were I to be successful getting the additional two years, um, I would have to get another fellowship. Um, and that would be looking at uh, an MRC uh, senior non-clinical fellowship or a Wellcome Trust fellowship um, and having a very, very brief look down the uh, down the list of people who have been awarded them and the success rates with those. It was pretty clear that the uh, the success rate for that is, is pretty low. And so uh, no matter how good your research is, uh, actually, the odds are the odds are stacked against you and you're competing across a very, very broad range of, uh, of research. Um, and so looking across all of those, uh, I think I'd, uh, it, the idea had come into my mind that it would be good to have a, a little bit more stability, a bit more ability to plan longer. And of course, uh, one of the ways in which you can do that is by moving on to a, a, a more academic career path, uh, if you like, rather than a pure research uh, fellowship. Uh, type type of approach, moving on to an academic path uh, through lecturers, uh, lecturer, associate professor, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so I spent a fair amount of time applying for uh, applying for jobs that had come up at the lecturer level uh, around and about. Um, and I think uh, the, the reason I ended up at uh, Reading was uh, that they offered me a position. So I think I applied for about something like 20 or 25 positions, went for interview at some of them, but didn't get any job offers. Uh, and then eventually, after about a year and a half of looking, um, Reading offered me the position. They offered it actually at an associate professor level, which was a, a, a fairly a fairly nice surprise. Um, and going there, visiting the labs, talking to the researchers there, actually, it was an interesting place to go. Um, there were a few people working on dementia and on neurodegeneration, but a much broader portfolio than I'd uh, experienced working at the Institute of Neurology. Obviously, the Institute of Neurology is, is uh, great if you're working on neurodegenerative diseases. There's every kind of neurodegeneration being studied there, and it's world-leading in many of those areas. Um, so it's a very different environment, but one actually I thought would be quite an interesting place to, uh, to work um, and also slightly more uh, livable if you like um, so the idea of uh, settling down in London and buying a house in London filled me with uh, with fear basically um, and so looking at, uh, at Reading actually it began to look like quite an attractive uh, attractive option from that perspective it's interesting because it, within all, all, of, all, all of that um, you've kind of highlighted just how difficult the academic career market is as well. So despite talking about all the prestigious places you've worked, the fellowships that you've been awarded, you still had to apply for 25 or 30 positions before landing your first PI job. Um, I think it really highlights how difficult this career track can be. 
I, I think I mean, just, just to add on to that, one of the things that uh, that really I took from uh, from that process was that quite often, whether or not you're offered a position, isn't really isn't much to do with you. Um, and quite often it's to do with what a department or a group or a university, what their strategic directions are. And you may not know when you apply for a position that may be badged as neuroscience, for example, uh, whether or not actually what they're looking for is somebody working on epilepsy and they've, they've cast it a, a, as a well, relatively wide net just to see if they get anyone else interesting. But actually, you're, you're kind of at a disadvantage right from the start. Um, so I think that's what one of the things that uh, over many years, um, you, you sort of develop an ability to uh, not take it personally. That, that, that often it isn't a direct comment on you. And I would say the same about papers and grants as well. In many cases, sometimes it's I, I know there are grants that I've written which have been rejected because they weren't any good. Uh, but I also I think there are grants and papers that I've submitted that haven't been published or accepted where I sent them, uh, not necessarily because of the science and because of me, uh, but because of other things that are, are going on in the background as well. So it's, it's sort of that quite uh, relatively early on, I think I I. I really work to try and not take things personally, which is very, very difficult and something I still find difficult today. Um, I think that's worth a, a podcast in itself, the, the, the dealing with rejection and failure and how you build that resilience. Yep. Um, arguably, the next move for you is maybe the most surprising, let's say. So you've gone from, from Reading to the vet, Royal Veterinary College in London. So again, can you maybe talk us through kind of the, the thought processes behind that? Yeah, I know. Again, it was it was one of these um, one of these points where you find yourself. Uh, and I really enjoyed my time at Reading. Actually, there are a lot of collaborations and areas of research uh, that I got involved in that I definitely would not have got involved in had I uh, remained at UCL. And so uh, there was a lot that I I got from that, and a lot of experience, a lot of teaching experience, a lot of uh, and administration, uh, university administration, uh, especially gets quite. Quite a bad, uh, quite a bad press. Uh, but actually, having a bit of experience of how a department runs and seeing, sitting in the meetings where uh, where decisions are made about appointments and things like that, actually, I, I found very, very useful. Um, and because Reading is a slightly smaller institution, you're a bit closer to um, to the decision makers and the people. Uh, in charge of the uh, the pots of money and so on and so forth. So actually, I, I found it a very, very, uh, really interesting experience and actually did, did some really interesting research while I was there. But one of the things that became clear after a couple of years was that there was a, a, a an underlying tension, and this is this is true of Reading, it's true of many places, uh, between the uh, the the teaching and the uh, delivery of lectures and uh, assessment of projects and so on and so forth, uh, and the uh, the more focused research side of things. And I was I was very fortunate; I uh, was able to get a couple of uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite chunky grants, uh, a new investigator grant from the MRC, which really helped. To establish me at Reading, uh, and then I was part of an MRC program grant led by uh, led by John uh, John Hardy, looking at the uh, the genes involved in uh, idiopathic Parkinson's, and so the, actually there was a lot of research going on. And what I found was that it was quite difficult to strike that balance between the teaching, which is the bread and butter of most universities, um, and that is what keeps the institution running, getting uh, undergraduates in, teaching them, uh, and preparing them for life in the outside world, uh, and the research. And it, it got to the point where that that tension was actually, it was, it was, it was causing me problems. I, I was unable to uh, find the time to write the grants and write the papers that I knew were sitting there. And there, there was quite a lot of, uh, there was an impetus there to, to really get the research going. And it was very, very difficult to find the time to do that. Um, and so I started looking around for uh, other possibilities where there was, I really enjoyed the teaching and I still really enjoy the teaching. Um, but the research is what was really driving me. And so looking for opportunities where there was not a, a complete shift away from uh, the teaching to a, a research only type role, but one where the research actually had a bit more of a priority. Uh, and it so happened that the uh, the vet college was advertising for, uh, for a position. Uh, I applied for it again. Um, 
not necessarily with any particular thought about how my uh, research into human Parkinson's would fit in with uh, veterinary research. And there's a, a actually not a, not really a tenuous link, but um, a, a perhaps a, a slightly more minor link between my PhD research and veterinary health in that I spent most of my PhD working on scrapie, which is a disease of sheep, uh, and a little bit of time working on uh, on human prion diseases. Uh, so there was something that I could look back to and something which I, I still found interesting, um, which I did, I definitely mentioned in my interview a couple of times, I think. Um, so it was really, it was looking around similar to the, uh, the, the, applying for uh, my first academic position, it was a matter of saying, actually, uh, who's who's interested? Who would uh, find me an interesting person to appoint? And so that that's really how I ended up uh, here. It was uh, on the off chance rather than a uh, deliberate strategy, I would say. And it seems, <clears throat> it seems throughout your career, you've, you've moved institutions at each kind of strategic point. And do you feel it's important to make moves and sort of freshen things up at each of these each of these points or can you achieve the same level of success within the same institution i think it's a it, very difficult uh, question to answer so i think um it depends very much on the individual and it depends very much on the research as well um so for me actually i found it really really refreshing moving from one institution to another so moving across from ucl to reading actually that really uh, gave me ideas and got my research moving in directions which i found really intellectually uh, stimulating um and uh, there are things that I'm, I'm still involved with now, which I wouldn't be involved with if I hadn't moved uh, away from UCL. Uh, and equally, moving here to the Vet College, uh, actually, there are things that I'm interested in now, projects which are partly because of the uh, the interruption of COVID and the disruption that that caused, projects which are only just starting to really get off the ground, uh, but are ones which I'm really, really interested in and actually are, are a little bit... Um, uh, they're not uh, not things that are being done by other people elsewhere. Uh, so looking at uh, disorders, neurological disorders in in animals uh, that match up to those that are seen in humans. Um, and actually, there's not a lot of research that's being done on those. So there's a, there's some very interesting research to be done there, I think. Uh, and actually, also, I'm uh, sort of touching back in with the prion diseases with a PhD student working on uh, uh, BSE, which is very, very interesting. Uh, so actually, for me, that has sort of it's refreshed, but also sort of brought me back full circle to some of the stuff which I'd done before. Now, that works well for me whether that would work well for everyone's uh, research. And I, I have many colleagues who have stayed at one institution and flourished and have taken advantage of all that uh, those institutions, both at Reading and at UCL. Uh, so I don't think it's, it's something you have to do. It, it depends upon the individual, I think. I've actually found it quite uh, invigorating, I would say. Um, but for others, actually, I don't think you necessarily need it. Um, okay, thanks for that, Patrick. That's been quite a nice run through from uh, the beginning of your academic career through to where we are today. Um, so we're going to move on to the next part of the podcast, which is to basically fire some fairly speedy questions at you around career and life tips. Okay, um, in this part of the show, we're going to have some fairly quick fire career questions. Um, so Patrick, if you can try and answer as briefly <laughs> concisely as possible okay uh, so the first question is what's one thing you wish someone had told you when you were at the career stage that i am at currently be strategic in saying yes and say no a lot concise thank you <laughs> second question um what's the best tip you can share on successful grant writing uh, I would say uh, talk to people about your ideas. So talk to your colleagues and actually talk to people outside of science uh, and get them to really question you. Um, because I think uh, that level of criticism, you're going to get that at some point anyway, right? So when it goes out to reviews, when it goes to a panel, when it, you're going to get that criticism. So better to have it early and know uh, and be able to change things uh, than later on where actually you don't have much choice. So talk to people and get them to question you. Um, the next one's quite... Uh unusual question but what do you do if anything to constantly challenge your underlying beliefs and assumptions uh so i would say read um and going back to what we were discussing uh, earlier this is something that uh, that i uh, i uh, 
I, I feel a little bit sad about that. I don't have as much time to read as I would, uh, as I did in the past. And there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, some of them are to do with work. Some of them are to do with uh, having a, a young family. Um, but in terms of challenging what I believe, what I, uh, my assumptions, and so on and so forth, read, 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 read the literature, read books, read, uh, read things that don't necessarily agree with the way in which you approach uh, science. Um, that's what I do to uh, to challenge myself. Um, Patrick, what habits <clears throat> have you found help you to be more productive? Uh, I'm not sure I'm a I'm particularly uh, particularly good person to ask that. I would guess the the one thing I would flag up is collaboration, um, because I think that really has helped me become more productive. Working in different areas with different people and doing things that other folk aren't through collaboration that's probably the thing that's helped me to be productive. Um, the next question is is one that we touched upon briefly going through your. Uh, career background and CV, but what do you do or how do you deal with failure or rejection? Uh, which is uh, a tough one. And I was discussing this with uh, a colleague uh, recently who uh, got, got a grant. Um, and I think basically, and again, this makes me a little bit sad to uh, say this, it's uh, by treating both triumph and disaster the same. Um, so not really celebrating that much when a paper gets accepted or a grant gets uh, grant gets funded and moving on to the next thing that's a sort of coping mechanism for me anyway uh, so that when a grant gets rejected or if a paper gets sent back without being sent out for review or something like that or the reviewers comments are, 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 are quite uh, quite disastrous um, again you sort of take it and then move on um, the problem is, of course, that that means that you don't celebrate things as much as you should when uh, things are going well. But for me, that's the coping mechanism that I have. Thanks, Patrick. Um, the last one, what would you say to someone who is starting to question their ability to keep going in science? Uh, I would say to them that, uh, again, from a personal perspective, I think that, that that's part of being a scientist. Um, I think questioning what you're doing, whether what you're doing is right, whether it's the thing for you, that's something that I've done a lot during my research career. Um, and there have been a number of moments where I've come very, very, very close to moving away from uh, sort of frontline research, if you like. Um, so I think my my comment would be actually, I think that that, that is part of science. Um, it's not necessarily a particularly enjoyable part, but it is part of it. Um, thanks, Patrick. So that was our quick fire uh, questions. Um, so just to kind of recap, I guess, uh, your your main points um, are essentially everybody should be reading more and collaborating more um, and try not to take things personally. And I, I think, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a few kind of steps behind you, let's say, on my sort of career pathway, but I, I, I would completely agree. So we don't get enough time to read. Um, it's a luxury that we had at earlier stages of our career, which no longer exists. Um, trying not to take things personally, I think, is certainly a skill that you develop as you progress through the system, I would say. I don't know anybody at the kind of PhD level or even postdoc level who have yet managed to kind of grow that thick skin and, and be able to distance themselves from the, from the comments. I think it, it's, it's, really it's really tricky, and I'm, I'm also struggling with that myself. Um, but it does get easier throughout the, um, the academic track, I would say. So thank you, Patrick. Okay, thanks, Patrick. We're now into the last segment of the show. And before we finish, we're going to talk a little bit about mentoring itself. So I've got a few questions for you about mentoring. Um, the first one is, why did you decide to become a mentor? And what advice would you have for anyone listening who doesn't yet have a mentor? Uh, so I, I mean, I think in a way it was a, uh, a natural part of developing as a, a researcher and building up uh, experience over uh, over years. So I've, I've benefited from uh, advice and guidance from a number of people uh, over the uh, over the course of my career. And so I think uh, not a, not in a sort of formal structure, if you like, but uh, certainly mentoring in one shape or another. Um, and I think the when opportunities have come up. Uh, both within institutions and through funding agencies uh, to uh, to do that in a more formal way. Um, I, I kind of saw it as a as a natural part of being a researcher and being uh, being an academic, uh, and really an opportunity for me to. Uh, 
give back a little um, as a uh, follow on from uh, from all of the uh, guidance and support that I'd had uh, during my career. Um, in terms of uh, those who perhaps don't have a mentor or aren't part of a, a formal scheme, uh, I'd, I'd strongly recommend it. I think it's a, it's a very useful way to get guidance and advice outside of a the, the sort of more rigid um, line manager career structure that you have within a, a laboratory or a department or a university. Uh, and I think it's a useful way to get slightly different perspectives. Um, and I think the more perspectives you have, uh, the better. Uh, within reason, I would say. So I would definitely recommend it. And um, and I think there are more and more opportunities, again, both within universities and outside of them uh, to, to get that. Um, so I, that's certainly something I would recommend. Great. Thanks, Patrick. I think the little bit I'll chip in with here at this point as well is that um, you don't have to be restricted to a mentor. Mm. And um, I, from, from my experience, so I have a number of mentors, obviously yourself, Patrick, being one. And the insight that you provide from an outside perspective is is really important. And also at that kind of professorial level is really important. But I have, I have mentors within Dundee as well that provide that institutional perspective on what I should be doing to kind of tick the boxes and, and, and progress through the institutional um, ladder. So I guess my one little bit of advice um, from here is to seek numerous mentors and for specific aspects of your career path and your career development. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good, uh, very good point indeed. Uh, next question, Patrick, is thinking thinking practically. So, how do you think someone might go about approaching someone that they have never met before to ask about being a mentor? So, I think I, my advice would be. Go ahead, draft an email and contact them, even if it's uh, out of the blue. Um, I, a slightly different uh, situation, but I remember when uh, when I was finishing up my PhD and I was looking for postdocs over in the States, I sent out a load of emails to different labs, uh, just asking if they had any opportunities coming up. So that was a, a sort of more formal uh, career, ex um, exploring a more formal career rather than mentoring. But I think the same thing holds true. And I, I, I would say that you would you should expect many people not to respond, uh, but again, not to take that personally. Um, so I would say just email them, say that you're interested in their uh, in their research and in their advice and in their guidance and whether they would consider um, becoming some form of mentor, either formally or informally. So I would just uh, give them uh, drop them a line and see what happens. Yeah, I, I would I would champion that advice as well. I think most academics at least from my experience, quite like receiving these kind of emails. Mm. Um, it's quite nice to hear that somebody values your opinion and would like some advice. So I think, yeah, identify the key individuals you want to speak to and just send out the emails. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, okay, Patrick, this is the last question we're going to ask on, on the podcast. And again, it's still mentor related. <laughs> uh, if you could choose anyone from history, dead or alive, to be your mentor, who would you choose and why? Ah, so this is a tricky one. I... I'm beyond those who uh, who I get advice and guidance from uh, already. Those who uh, supervise me through my PhD uh, and uh, who I collaborated with and still collaborate with over many many years. Beyond them, um, I would say, and sort of going uh, going back to a, a Scottish theme, uh, I would say Billy Connolly. Um, I think I would uh, I would find his insight on life and Parkinson's as well, of course, uh, a very, very valuable uh, additional bit of uh, perspective on the work that I do. Fantastic. Not the answer I was expecting at all, Patrick. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thanks again, Patrick. Um, that's all we have time for today. Um, I'd like to thank my amazing mentor and, and guest for this podcast, Professor Patrick Lewis. And thanks very much, Chris. It's been great, uh, great chatting. If you would like to find out more about Patrick and his work, you will find his and also my bio, if you're interested, on the Dementia Research website. Please feel free to reach out to either of us if you have any questions about what you've heard today uh, or about our research. Uh, thank you very much to Alzheimer's Research UK for bringing us together. Uh, this is a fantastic mentorship scheme, and um, it's great to be able to, to talk and share our insight uh, for everybody uh, today. And also, the Ask Your Mentor podcast will be back soon with another mentee talking to their mentor. But for now, I'm off to go and plan uh, my own career. Thanks so much. Thanks for Patrick's advice. Um, 
As I say, my name is Chris Henswich, and you've been listening to the Ask the Mentor podcast from Dementia Researcher in association with Alzheimer's Research UK. Goodbye. Bye now. Thank <laughs> you.